Good afternoon. It's so nice to see you guys sitting so obediently in your seats. It's a truly auspicious beginning of a talk about disobedience and rebellion. So let us travel back in time. The Imperial Japanese Army was one of the most formidable enemies that this nation has ever faced, certainly in the Second World War. As part of the legacy of this war, this army is often being perceived as a bastion of blind obedience to authority. Its soldiers, as you can see here, are often denigrated as blind, faultless, and obedient robots. Like with any myth, there is some truth in it. Japanese soldiers were indeed trained to follow every order given by superior officer, even rushing to their death in front of machine gun fire, or taking their own life rather than falling into captivity. But that was just a small part of a much more complicated picture. As I will show you today, politically speaking, the Japanese army was one of the most disobedient armies in the world. And let me give you one example. In 1931, a military terror organization called the Cherry Blossom Society attempted to wipe out the entire Japanese cabinet with naval bomber planes, poisonous gas, and machine gun fire. What was their punishment, do you think? 25 days of confinement to an inn. Guys, I received more severe punishments as a soldier in the army, and I didn't murder anyone, mind you. <laughs> but in Japan of the 1930s, rebellion was almost no news. Ministers, prime ministers, businessmen, generals, court officials, and other dignitaries were murdered almost on an annual, sometimes on a monthly basis. And guess what? The officers who perpetrated such outrages were often left unpunished or punished very leniently. And this had worldwide political significance. Government by assassination, thus an eminent American journalist described the Japanese regime at the time. The army has swept aside a series of terrified civilian cabinets leading the nation into militarism, dictatorship, and finally into the Second World War and total destruction. How and why did it happen? That's just the question my research sets to explore. And I would argue that that was an unintended, combined result of three disconnected decisions. Bear with me here. The first one was the basic character of the Japanese regime. Modern Japan was founded in 1868 by competing factions. These factions had used the emperor, this guy that you see here, as a symbol to unify them. But the emperor, absolute in theory, was in fact an empty political center. He was a child. He couldn't really give orders or form government policy. What actually happened was that imperial edicts were drafted by all sorts of ministers and advisors around the throne. Then, rebellious politicians, disgruntled ministers, and other unsatisfied elements could always say, hey, 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 wait, government policy? That's not the decision of his imperial majesty. That's just the treacherous advisors around the throne. Others, after several rebellions were launched in the name of the emperor, a second decision was made. In order to prevent politicians getting hold of army units, the army was directly linked to the empty imperial center, to the emperor. And then, yet, there was another unintended result. The generals could 
form their own independent foreign policy, could ignore the civilian government, using the name and the prestige of the emperor as an excuse. And the emperor didn't really speak, did not really give orders. But this political agency in the beginning was limited to a small group of older, experienced people, mostly responsible. They didn't want to rock the boat and did not want to use violence against other Japanese. But then the fair decision came into the picture. The Japan had led several wars on the continent in the end of the 19th century, in China and then in Russia. Because Japan was a poor country, and did not have the resources to lead a prolonged war, the war said to be quick and decisive. And for order for wars to be quick and decisive, young officers had to get a lot of tactical discretion in the field, because they're on the ground, they know what to do best. And then there was yet a third unintended result. The young officers had seen their seniors the top generals, disobeying the civilian cabinet in the name of the emperor. And they thought to themselves, hey, couldn't we use the name of the emperor to disobey the generals? So instead of taking tactical decisions, young officers began to take strategic decisions on the ground. For example, assassinating foreign leaders to solve military problems. The Queen of Korea was assassinated in 1895 by a group of officers. Then it happened yet again in China. And if it was okay to murder foreign leaders, why not to assassinate Japanese leaders as well? And generals, the army and the civilian cabinet had quickly deteriorated into a brutal factional war of all against all. This, as we had seen, was a result of his three disconnected decisions. Each and every one of his decisions was rational. Each and every one of them was set and designed to solve a specific problem. Each and every one of them was designed to maintain order. Together, they created a mutation, a monster, a culture of disobedience, rebellion, and chaos. And this chaos spread like a contagious disease from top down to the civilian and military apparatus. And when the government had finally realized what happened, when the government had finally realized that the army went out of control and the Japanese body politics is sick to the death, it was already too late to do anything about it. Thank you very much.